All right, hey everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about caching. I know it's everybody's favorite subject, um, but who am I? So my name's Ian McLeod. I work at a company called Convoy, where we do trucking-related things with GraphQL. Um, so one of the interesting things we're doing is we have a React Native app that we provide to our truckers. So we're a marketplace that connects people who want to ship things with the truckers that actually make those things move. Um, but we're in this unique space where we have to support a wide variety of phones. We don't want to interrupt the work that our truckers do, and they're usually using their personal phones. And often, you're dealing with really old Android phones, um, really old versions of OSs. Things get slow. Things have no memory. It's tough. Um, another challenge we deal with, too, is our truckers go to remote locations. They may not have cell connectivity. Our app has to work offline. They have to be able to do their jobs. So we're constantly tracking things offline. We're also executing, because of that, we're, we're kicking off very large queries to cache all that data. And, and to make it available while they are offline. And then to compound that, our application isn't an application where drivers are constantly interacting with it. Largely, stuff is happening in the background. So we're tracking their location, triggering different events based on that. And so as a result, the app has a good number of query observers active in any given time. So anytime the cache changes, they all get updated, and various things happen in, behind the scenes. Um, so because of this, about a year and a half ago, um, we were seeing extremely poor performance. So boot times could take anywhere from 10 seconds to minutes. Um, our app would freeze all the time. You would tap on something, it would freeze for a couple seconds. You would do nothing, and it would freeze for a couple seconds. We were really good at freezing. Um, and and this, is, this is happening even on the fastest phones at the time. So something was clearly off. Um, so we dug into it, and a lot of it turned out to be time spent reading from the Apollo cache. So we, we started to profile this. We were, we were observing that like, we would, a query would come back from the server. It would write it to the cache, to Apollo's internal representation of, of that, that query. And then we would see the vast majority of time spe spent past that just reading the data out of the cache to provide it to our components or to provide it to our background services. So digging into that, also garbage collector was firing all the time. So there's a bunch of objects being created. That's weird. Um, and then also, because we had all these query observers, we, we noticed that they were, the, they were a large source of this. So what exactly was going on there? And it turned out really to be somewhat structural with the, cache, the way the cache works. And let me get into that. So this is where we're going to get into some, some guts of how Apollo works, hopefully in the lightning talk. Um, so first, how does Apollo represent state? Uh, this is Apollo's default in memory implementation. Um, the, way it does, the way it represents state is with a lookup table. So on the left here, you've got a GraphQL query response coming back from the server. And on the right is roughly how Apollo represents it internally. So it takes all the nodes in your graph, it flattens them out, has a lookup table by ID. And then anywhere a node references another node, it injects a little pointer, an ID, a string, and some other, some other metadata so that it knows to walk that. Now, the problem is anytime you read data from the cache, anytime you ask for data from Apollo, it has to go and reverse, reverse that operation. So it's taking this flat structure building an entire object hierarchy out of it and then giving it to you so you can render it in, in React or wherever you're going to use it. And it turns out that's slow. It also ends up generating a ton of objects, hence all the garbage collection we were seeing. It's also worth noting, too, Relay operates in a very similar way. Um, so we're in a bit of a pickle. What are we going to do about this? Um, one option was to simplify our application. Honestly, that was a non-starter. We would have to remove so much of our, our queries and, and behavior that it just wouldn't work for our drivers. Another option was Relay. And actually, Relay turns out to still be quite a bit faster for a lot of these things. Um, but even then, it doesn't scale with large number of query observers. So if you look at the, uh, the five observer and the 25 observer benchmarks, you'll notice that Relay has linear growth and performance with that. And it just doesn't really work for us. So we did what all developers do. And we make the, sorry, and we make the problem worse. Um, so uh, in, Luckily, around this time, uh, Apollo was actually uh, Apollo 2 was happening, and they they were just in the fa in the process of factoring out their cache API. So we were able to jump right on that and implement an alternative cache without implementing a whole new GraphQL client. Um, so we call that cache Hermes. Um, it's an unfortunate code name that stuck around, and now it's stick. Now it's great. So we stuck with it. Um, and largely, the goal of Hermes is to minimize the amount of time done when reading, because that's really what was hurting us. And the way it does that is by representing state as closely as possible to how uh, your data comes back from the cache. So the way we do that actually is by representing this cache as a graph internally. So it's hard to, hard to visualize here, but if you look in this, the same query as before, 
rather than having uh, string references that point to the node's IDs, Hermes points directly to the underlying objects. So you got the posts, they point to the two posts referenced by one and two. Within each post, there's authors. All, all of those point to the exact same JavaScript object that's pointed to by the, the key A. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of bookkeeping that happens under the covers here to make this happen. Hermes does immutable updates to this. It, it's certainly pretty complicated the way it does it, but as an added benefit, effectively, you can ask for data from the cache, and it can give you that result in constant time straight up. Um, so this really helps speed up reads at the cost of slowing down writes a bit. Um, and as a result, uh, the, the numbers get pretty great with Hermes. So uh, this caveat here, th this, is, this is a query that we use internally that is tuned largely for Hermes. Um, in regular operation, it's a little bit slower, but still much faster than the alternatives. Um, yeah. So I want to get in a little bit more into like, what the trade-offs Hermes are making are, what you need to be aware of if you end up wanting to use it. Um, so here's some more examples. So one of the challenges with Hermes is it can actually over-return data. So in this case, we're asking for a blog post in some fictional blog service. You're asking for a bunch of, bunch of details about it. So far, so for, straightforward, I hope. Um, now, let's say you want to query out a list of posts. And in that list of posts is the same post you referenced before by that other query sometime in the past. Because Hermes is pointing to the same underlying object, you're going to get those extra fields because the cache had already had them, and there's only one copy of that entity in the, in the graph. So it can be a challenge. If you're not careful, you might reference these fields when you shouldn't be. But things like type checking and uh, Apollo's uh, TypeScript generation from this help you avoid these sorts of problems. And it's also worth noting, we've been using Hermes in production for, I guess, about a year now, and we haven't encountered any problems from this. Um, another thing, so Hermes is not a silver bullet for performance. Um, one of the places where it, it has some challenges is with parameterized fields. So this is going to be even, an even more complicated example. Bear with me. So let's say you want to query the current user's active blog posts. You write a query like this. And internally, Hermes is going to represent it something like this. So it's saying, OK, I know the viewer's ID and name, those are static, static fields. They're going to exist with that entity. But then we have this post status active field. That, that parameter may change. So Hermes can't safely just toss that as a status field on, the, on the, the, the viewer. It has to store it separately so that when you ask for it or you ask for a different field, it doesn't return that as well. So this is roughly what it's looking like. Let me give another example, hopefully, to drive that point home and make it a bit clearer. So now let's say you ask for the user's draft posts. So we change the, that field there. When that query kicks off, Hermes is going to store that as a different node in its internal graph. And then when you read it, um, which is the far right, it will overlay those values on top of your result. So it's, it's worth noting like, like this, this means that Hermes isn't returning this data in constant time, but it's still re minimizing the amount of work it has to do for queries like this. It's also worth noting that we have some uh, tactics that help you mitigate this cost, but I'm not going to go into it. We have a directive you can sl slap on here that, that tells Hermes that this thing is never going to change. Just trust me. Um, yeah. And then another really neat benefit of all the, uh, the bookkeeping that Hermes is doing is that we can implement garbage collection pretty much out of the box. So Hermes does automatic reference counted garbage collection. It's basic, but it's good enough in most cases. So anytime you, you run a query and then you run a different query and some, and some of the data has been orphaned, Hermes will just get rid of it for you. And it turns out this is really important for a mobile application where you don't have much memory available. Um, it note, it's worth noting, too, that it, it's not smart enough to deal with cyclic subgraphs and other, uh, other cases like that. So it's not perfect, but it's good enough. And that's it. Um, so if you want to check out Hermes, you can, you can take a look at it here. Also, if you want to play with the benchmarks, take a look at, the, at them there. And feel free to contact me, uh, Twitter, GitHub, or email. Thanks.